This program is brought to you by the friends and partners of Biblical Life TV. Deep waters to nurture and empower the remnant for the last days. There is a power that is about ready to be released from heaven to those that seek after the things of the kingdom of God. When it comes to the word of God, there is a supernatural unction of the Holy Spirit to learn. God is up to something for those that will study to show yourself approved. Right now there's a lot of things in the kingdom that God is trying to establish that goes against people's theology. You need to understand your roots, where you came from. God may require us to change what we're doing to make walking in the kingdom a higher priority than it ever was before. We were never called to have a little light. We were called to be ablaze with the fire of God in this generation. Join the remnant from around the world who are empowered by the Word of God to fulfill God's purpose in these last days. God is speaking something different. That is going to be essential in the days ahead, and that's part of this anointing that we have to have. Prepare yourselves for spirit-filled teaching. Biblical Life TV. If I could give a name to today's message, it's Passover, still the answer to the priesthood of darkness. You know, as I watch what's been going on since the last election, and even during the election process and everything else, I'm seeing that the Shinar directive continues. You know, the priesthood of darkness has been working for centuries to perfect a witch's brew, if you will, to set the stage for the return of the son of perdition. And as I look at it and look at the various models that they use, nothing uh, comes close to the template that they established in Nazi Germany. And I, want, I just want to review some things and, and see if this doesn't kind of fit with COVID and a lot of things that was going on. Because it wasn't just the rise of Adolf Hitler, it was what precipitated the rise. And if you study after World War I, uh, Churchill and others demanded that Germany make reparations for World War I to all the nations. And which bankrupted the Malamar Republic. To the place that they had something called stag inflation. And I read a journal of one young girl who that one day she said, you know, I always wondered what it was like to be a trillionaire. And she said, today I made a trillion dollars or a trillion marks, if you will, for my one day's job. And at the height of it, it was so bad that you were working that whole day to get your wages, but they would give you your wages at lunchtime so that you could run out that day to buy food with that trillion dollars that you made because by the close of business, the price of that food may have doubled. <clears throat> and that wages had to literally be established over and over again on a daily basis. They destroyed the economy. We're beginning to see things right now in America. <clears throat> you know, we're looking at remodeling the, uh, the conference center and getting that up and running since... November of last year, the price of wood has gone up 500%. Now, let me kind of give you an idea of that. If it would cost you $25,000 for the wood to frame a house, it now costs you $125,000. We're beginning to see shortages on a lot of things, not because the materials aren't there, it's because the entire distribution and manufacturing system was shut down. And that small businesses are closing at a rate that is, it is unbelievable. At the same time, our new administration on the struggling small businesses, what their solution is, we're going to raise your taxes. They're trying to create... I have never seen a party that is so committed to the destruction of a nation. Now their narrative has been that they're going to, you know, America is on the downcline and they're going to administrate this downcline. 
what the Trump administration did is prove to us that if you do the right things, there was no need for a downcline. Because it went from going five miles an hour to 70 miles an hour just in a matter of a couple of years with the right policies in place. And so it kind of destroyed their narrative. But they have gone back to that because they need that narrative, not only in America, but worldwide. We're seeing the same thing throughout Europe and so many different places. Something that people forget is that Nazi, Nazis was a socialist party. Socialism is, is joined at the hip with Nazism. And in this, now socialism, and you say, well, what's the difference between socialism and communism? Well, according to Lenin, it was socialist or communist without a gun. Literally, that, that's his words. Now, when you don't have guns and we have guns, welcome to communism, okay? And its origin is Adam Weishaupt and his five principles. That when Marx began developing the, the Communist Manifesto, he simply plagiarized Adam Weishaupt. And anybody with an IQ over seven can figure that out if you just read both of them. But this socialism that was so toxic to the German people. Now, you guys need to realize, you know, like what we're, we're talking about now that's going on and we're referring to China. How many know that's not the Chinese people? It was something called the CCP that invaded China and took it over. And that entire nation is being held captive to thugs there. The exact same thing happened in Nazi Germany. A small group of people, because of the implosion of the economy, set the groundwork for Nazi Germany to raise up. And several things that they implemented that Hitler himself bragged about. Number one is total gun control. The only one that had guns were Nazis. In any nation, any nation, that only the police department and the brown shirts, a civilian force, that is like a civilian military force, that nation, its population is doomed. Well, Mike, that can never happen in America. Obama called for it during his administration. It's like, I can't believe that he's publicly calling for brown shirts. Doesn't anybody understand their history? You see, it's the template. Nazi Germany is the template. In the generation prior to the Nazis rising up, they had to sow seeds within, as viruses within the minds of men. The first one was evolution. You have to have more faith in evolution than you do to believe the Bible. Simply because they have actually done the math. And how many know we've been here actually longer than 5,000 years? It's probably closer to 9,000 when you bring in before uh, Rabbi Kiba actually altered the Old Testament before it was established in what became the Masoretic text, he tried to obfuscate the reality that Jesus was the Messiah from the Jewish people. And he altered the Torah. He altered uh, many prophetic things, especially when it comes to, uh, to Messianic prophecies. He altered them. But the two things he couldn't get a hold of was the Septuagint, that by his time was known as the Christian Bible, and he didn't know about the Dead Sea Scrolls, which have all validated the Septuagint is actually more accurate. But when you also look at it, uh, Stan Dale's done the research on this, and I, I quoted it in one of the conferences I did last year, that they have realized that the speed of light since creation has slowed down one million times. What that does in, in the space of six to 9,000 years, you can experience 50 million years of geological time. That's why carbon dating doesn't work. I mean, God's bringing all this stuff out, but they're also figuring that there has not been enough time in the universe for evolution to, to happen. There's a problem with it. Well, it's absolute science. Well, there's a lot of things that was absolute science yesterday that was disproved today. You know, when uh, Einstein was teaching... And uh, his teacher's assistant the second year said, uh, what, uh, where's the exam for this year? He says, oh, we used the one for last year. 
And he says, well, they already know the answer. He says, no, all the answers change this year. Because discovery reputes what they believed at one time and found out that it was false. We have that all the time. And so now they're coming up with panspermia. Aliens came. But if we didn't have enough time to evolve, how did the aliens evolve? Huh. No one ever is this circular logic. But see, evolution that we're evolving to something is a lie of the watchers. Because eugenics and spiritism begins falling in with all these same things. And if you actually look at it, and there was, there was a Russian mathematician that was, there's only like a handful of people that can do quantum algebra. Only a handful. It's the most complicated mathematics and, and researching the universe that has ever existed. And his discovery was between five to 9,000 years ago, the universe was perfect. It was right after the seventh day. And what's interesting is he submitted to all these secular mathematicians, and they said, we can't argue with your math, we just don't like the conclusion. So evolution is a lie. That's watch your connection number one. Eugenics is another one. That we, that we can breed and it's all about DNA. Do you know what your DNA is? You know your DNA determines whether you're going to be sick or healthy. Well see my DNA couldn't make up its mind because the first half of my life it thought I was skinny. And somewhere along the line my DNA changed its mind and now it's stuck on stupid. Okay, but what we have found out about DNA, there are large portions of it that lifestyle and behavior can turn switches on and off. This is something the occult have known forever. That's why they are so disciplined in, their, in the spiritual things they do. Not only are they trying to evoke the seventh heaven, they're actually trying to modify their DNA. Okay. Your DNA is not the sum of who you are. And it is rewritable by the blood of Jesus and walking in the commandments of God. But one of the cool things, and I document this in my first book that we found out about DNA, Harvard University discovered there's an antenna array on the outside of it. From your DNA on up, you were wired to hear the voice of God. They're trying to figure out what cosmic vibrations it was that our DNA was wired to. I know what it was. It's the voice of my father. But see, eugenics is the lie that we can breed ourselves into something better. Now, in the research, we have discovered that Hitler was actually trying to backbreed using eugenics, trying to come up with pure Nephilim. Okay. That makes you put this big question mark because he believed in inner earth and that there were Nephilim, he calls them something else, were still living on inner earth and he knew that they were about ready to emerge and when they did, he did not want the German people to become their slaves. He wanted them to evolve to the place where they were their equals. But he had to go backward to do it. He had to go back to try to back breed to Genesis 6. You take evolution and eugenics together and you get something called transhumanism. Has anybody ever heard of that? And is this going crazy? Occultism, spiritism was another one. In our society, we think that you can have a purely secular society. Secular society will always race toward the occult whether they want to or not. And the very historians and those that have been historic figures that promoted secularism, when you pull back the veil on them, every one of them were an occultist. Madame Blavatsky... Sir Francis Bacon, so many. They were occultists. Anybody ever heard of something called technocracy? That's coming up a lot. Scientism. Well, that's something new. No, it, it emerged before World War II, and Nazi Germany embraced it. That the scientists were running everything. That's why they could have detailed charts of all the people that they terminated and all the Jews that they killed and all the Christians that they killed and everything. I mean, it was charts and they sent reports. We were able to exterminate this many this month. 
to go to the Fuhrer's solution. It was done scientifically with great accuracy as, as well as scientific disconnection. They had to say that people of darker skin were subhuman, that Jews were subhuman. That there, there's a, another category. In fact, I, I was listening to one commentator the other day, and he was trying to do that with liberals. Now, ideologically, I can think your, ide, you know, your, your ideology is, in a sense, subhuman. But anytime you take a human being and you try to categorize them as a subhuman, that's a Nazi tactic. And we've got to be careful with that. Every person is created in the image of God. Jesus, when he was asked about, you know, should we pay taxes? He said, let me see a coin. And if you don't understand what he was saying, you miss it because you've you got to think like a first century rabbi. He asked for coins, say, render unto Caesar what is rend under, under Caesar, and what is God unto God. But on the image of that coin was a man named Caesar who had the image of God stamped on him. So at the same time, he was saying Caesar would one day have to give an account to the Creator because his image is stamped there. We can't forget that. The, the image of God is not stamped on somebody because of the color of their skin. If you are human, there is one race. It's called the human race. We have many ethnic backgrounds because God loves variety. And there's some minor differences. But all of them are human and we all need one another. Let me tell you what scares the hell out of the Luciferian elite. We all get together, find out that we're all family and that they're the problem. Because in their own twisted theology, they believe that they're homo superior. They're going to replace the homo sapiens. And so, I mean, it's, it's, you look at it, it's all scur scurry, but they use scientism, they use technocracy. And now we're saying, we need to follow the scientific data. After World War II, politics and, and money begin to take over the scientific community. Absolutely. You begin looking at the funding. I remember listening to Dr. Ted Brewer and he was talking about, they did this study to see if vitamin E could prevent heart attacks. And there was this big study done and there was a fictitious company called Natural Vitamin E Company that actually they used synthetic but buried in the pages of the research, even though the synthetic vitamin E could not uh, prevent a heart attack, it could reduce cancer by almost 85%. In buried in the research, but that never made the headlines because their goal was, here's a bunch of money, and I want you to come to this conclusion. If you don't, you'll never get funded again. How many know scientists like to eat? And now we have politics driving science. And politics is one of the most stupid creatures on planet Earth. It is fickle. It is the pit bull that you feed today and will eat you tomorrow. Because it, you know, you see the body of Christ shifting whichever way the wind blows. We're going like this, but what's going like this is politics. <laughs> it is a fickle thing. We also see fascism was a vital part of, of the Nazi German regime. Well, what's fascism? Because we're hearing that a lot, aren't we? You Republicans are fascists. You're, you're fascists. You're fascists. We even have an anti-fascist group that tends to be fascist, but let's just, let's just look on. Fascism is the fusion of government and industry for a specific agenda against the population. What we're finding out with this past election is we would have government officials say, ban this person on Twitter. Get this person off Facebook. You better censor these things. So we had government instructing the technocracy to violate the First Amendment. And so we see this dynamic going on. We need to realize that in the development of Nazism, that one of the first things that invaded was the church. You know how it did it? Mularu. 
In fact, there's one picture of Hitler coming out of a Lutheran church holding his hat in reverence in his hands as he was taking over. But they got them addicted to the government money because nobody had any money to give to the church. And here's the line that you've got to preach. We now have preachers preaching the gospel of COVID-19 vaccinations. That should never be coming out of the pulpit. It better be the gospel of Jesus Christ. What we should do is put all the facts, pro and cons, to the people. Let them look at the facts, pray, and make a decision for themselves. This template is being followed in America. Now, one of the interesting things that I discovered when I was in Germany, you're not going to find this in a history book. It's amazing when you're actually in country, some of the things that you discover. We do know from history that not, not, Hitler feared any occultist that was not under his control. He actually had a, a, a um, contract out on Ali Esther Crowley because he was afraid that Ali Esther Crowley, being from the United Kingdom, would league with the United Kingdom to occultly come against him. So there was this hit piece. And you kind of see these things going on, but there's another aspect of the story I'm going to do a Paul Harvey. When I was over there, I, I had the blessing of being part of the end of a revival that had went for decades over in Germany. And in it, I got to, to know a lot of German people. And what history will not tell you, no, some of it you, know, you can dig out, like before World War I, the Theological Society in Germany rejected the baptism of the Holy Spirit and set themselves up for World War I, World War II, the rise of the Nazis, and everything else. Hitler feared Pentecostal ministers and any minister that was spirit-filled. So as the Nazis took over and he aligned himself with non-spirit-filled denominations, Lutheranism, Lutheranism is, was the predominant one in Germany because of history, he drove out all the Pentecostal and spirit-filled ministers out of that nation as Germany was taking power. The very last one, as he was getting ready to cross the border, turned and prophesied to Nazi Germany and said, My spirit this day is leaving Germany, and he will not return again until he comes in the boots of the army that conquers you. And one of the greatest lasting revivals in Germany that not only went across the military bases, but into the public as a whole was a revival that started with the American soldier. Because the occult fear those that know the word and are filled with the spirit of God. That ought to be an indication for every one of us. Well, Brother Mike... I don't speak in tongues. Well, who said speaking in tongues was the only manifestation? In fact, the Apostle Paul, looking at a tongue-talking church, says, does everybody speak in tongues? No. How long shall we seek the baptism of the Holy Spirit? Do you come up and you can glow at night? Greater hunger for the Word, greater love for God's Word, greater love for God's commandment, greater love for God's people. Those are all signs. Boldness. Not being a poop head and calling it boldness, but biblical boldness. Some people like to argue because they like to argue when they don't even understand the argument. They still like to hear themselves talk. Okay? Some other interesting things that came out of it. As I continue to do research, the Nazis had something called trance channelers that uh, were able to pierce the veil. And they were getting advanced technologies from the watchers. And so Nazi Germany was not supposed to win the war. It was a laboratory. But the Allied nations, as they seeded all these German scientists, not a one of them went to Nuremberg, they came with not only their advanced technology, but the story of where they got it from, seeded it into every nation. And after Roswell, there is a lot of evidence and there's testimony from men of God that I know. That I've met personally like Stan Deo that uh, these fallen beings have built underground military bases. And many of them they've taken over. 
But there have been some daring men and women that have come out and said, listen, I was civilian or I was military. I was in these, and there's still a lot I can't share with you, they would say. But an interesting thing that we were told. While we're down there and around these beings, we can never, ever, ever, under any circumstance, use the name of Jesus, even if we're using it as a curse word, because those things will react violently at the mention of the name. <laughs> you see, guys, what we need to remember is that regardless of what lies before us, the name of Jesus, the power of his blood is enough to get us through. What we need to do is go deeper. And I want to look at three different views of the cross today. And the first one I want to look at is the one found in Matthew 27, starting in verse 33. I should have looked at when I started preaching. I didn't, so I'm going to reset. No. <laughs> no, it's going to be one of them hour and a half sermons. It might be. I'm going to read through the whole of the Scripture and then comment because I, am at, I, I, I tend to stop in like 50 places and then it takes me five times longer to edit the video, so I'm going to actually try to behave myself. And when they came to the place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull, they gave him uh, the wine to drink mixed with gall, and after tasting it, he was unwilling to drink. And when they crucified him, they divided up his garments among themselves by casting lots, and sitting down, they began to keep watch over him there. And above his head, they put up the charge against him, which read, This is Jesus, King of the Jews." At that time, two robbers were crucified with him, one on the right hand and one on the left. And those passing by were hurling abuse at him, wagging their heads and saying, You who are going to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. In the same way, the chief priests also, along with the scribes and the elders, were mocking him and saying, He saved others, he cannot save himself. He is, he is the king of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross, and we will believe him. He trusts in God. Let God rescue him now. If he delights in him, as he said, I am the son of God. And the robbers who had been crucified with him were also insulting him with the same words. Now from the sixth hour, darkness fell upon the land until the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And, those, and some of those who were standing there, when he heard it, began saying, This man is calling for Elijah. Immediately one of them ran, and taking a sponge, he filled it with sour wine and put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink. But the rest of them said, Let us see whether Elijah will come to save him. And Jesus cried again with a loud voice and yielded up the ghost. And behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And the earth shook and the rocks were split. And the tombs were opened and many bodies of the saints that had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they entered into the holy city and appeared to many. Now the centurion and those who were keeping, who were with him keeping guard over Jesus when they saw the earthquake and the things that were happening became very afraid and said, truly, this was the Son of God. There's a lot in this scripture. Now what I don't want anybody to be like was years ago, I was teaching over at Specker Barracks Chapel at Fort Leonard Wood. And a guy came in and said, I can prove tongues. It's in the Bible. Jesus spoke in tongues. And he turned to this verse and said, Eli, Eli, lama sabach, then I is tongues. And then the writers gave us the interpretation. They had the gift of interpretation. Actually, that's Aramic. Let's, let's, not, let's <laughs> dig a little deeper in our theological stance. But the earth itself began to respond as Jesus was crucified for us. That the earth itself repulsed and shook. So much so, how many know these soldiers, this wasn't their first crucifixion? It was old hat to them. 
When they first came into country, many times the roads would be lined with those crucified. So this, this was like the 10,000th crucifixion, if you will, that they may have attended in their duties. You know, you get numb to that after a while. There was something about the crucifixion of Jesus that startled these men. So much so that you have pagan Gentiles saying, this guy had to be the Son of God. What was going on? You know, we, we look at it, we realize that it was there that Jesus was the propitiation for our sins. That a long time ago, Abraham was called of God to offer his only begotten son on the altar for God. And God provided a ram, not a lamb. And Abraham prophesied God would provide for himself a lamb. And the sages of Israel, ever since Abraham, have been looking for the Lamb of God. That's why when John the Baptist saw Jesus that day on the shores of Jordan, he said, Behold the Lamb of God, this Lamb that we have been looking for for millennia. Behold, there He is. Because God's covenant man was willing to give up His Son a promise for God, it opened the door that God could offer up His Son to redeem man. And at that moment, the cross became the doorpost of planet Earth. And there was blood over the doorposts. Now if Jerusalem was established as the doorpost to planet earth, is there any wonder that the mystery religions seek to control Jerusalem? God declared that was the doorpost. The high priest and his duties, one of the things that he had to do is he had to go down to Bethlehem and choose a lamb that would be offered for all of Israel. Yet as they were planning the trial of Jesus, he declared that the lamb that was born in Bethlehem, his name was Jesus, be offered up for all of Israel. And there were times in the narrative where Jesus said, I thirst. Those were strategic words that were uttered by the high priest. And see, the high priest was kind of in and out of the crucifixion of Jesus. At the moment that Jesus said, I thirst, the high priest was on the temple mount. And they, they would slaughter lamb after lamb after lamb for the families that were going to have Passover. When he got to the one, the one that he chose for all of Israel, he would stop, put down the knife, and say, I thirst. I think if you could have been between the Temple Mount and the cross, you would have heard stereo. Because Jesus, as the high priest, as he was getting ready to give up the ghost was declaring as the high priest of our faith that I am the lamb that was selected. We do not need to get mad at the Jewish people. And then there, there is this thing of, you know, the Jewish people crucified Christ. If they hadn't, they were the only covenant people that could do it. Now, I need to remind you, there were also a bunch of Gentiles there facilitating it too. It was a group effort. When I read about the crucifixion and all that, I get so angry at people trying to belittle African people. Because it was a black man that helped Jesus carry the cross when he couldn't. And so if there by chance might have been some little bit of stigma somewhere that somebody in history can try to resurrect or something, and 99.9% .9 of it they just make up. To the prejudice against black people that was redeemed when that man was tasked to help Jesus carry the cross. Oh, I, I hate racism with everything on the inside of my being. You see, the cross takes care of all this. That blood was shed in our behalf. 
Now let's go to Isaiah 53. I'm going to have to get me a Kleenex box. I think I got one here. I don't know if you guys are crying. I'd make myself cry sometimes. Nothing is more precious to me than what Jesus did for us. Nothing is more precious. And I find it interesting, and in a sense, Isaiah prophesied that God was going to blind the, blind the Jewish people to the reality of Messiah because he starts out this prophetic word, who's going to believe my report? Verse 1. Who has believed our report, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of the parched ground. He had no stately form or majesty that we should look upon him, nor appearance that we should be attracted to him. He was despised and forsaken of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with griefs. And like one from whom men hid their faces, he was despised and we did not esteem him. Surely our griefs he himself bore and our sorrows he carried. Yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But, that's what you think, but here's the reality. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. And the chastisement of our well-being fell upon him. And by his scourging, we are healed. In those moments, everything that Adam opened the door for, that the iniquity force did into mankind in the earth, Jesus at one moment bore upon himself on the cross all past and all future. The cross of Christ is the ultimate singularity in space-time. Because in that moment, the cross had the blood of eternity running down it. That's why all those that hoped for him prior to it can trust in that work. Trusted in that work, they're looking for the Lamb of Abraham. We're saved. And us 2,000 years later, I'm here to confess that blood is just as potent as it was 2,000 years ago. And it can take the vilest sinner and wash them clean. And they become a new creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have come new. But it wasn't just to save our soul. He was crushed. The King James says, bruised for our iniquity. Iniquity and sin is two different things. Sin is a violation of the law. Iniquity is your bend or your twist toward that sin. And if you would take an arm that was bent towards something and straighten it out, you would bruise it or crush it. I have found people that have found great spiritual relief by not only pleading the blood, but pleading the bruises of Christ and asking God to straighten out their souls that are bent toward iniquity. Flavius Josephus, in his writings, the historian of the day said that Jesus was reduced to human rubble. Can you imagine the weight of sin, sickness, all the grief, all the pain, all the things that ever came because of original sin fell on him both past and present in one spot. Uh, a nice way, maybe a, a more modern way of saying what Flavius Josephus said was basically to say that he was re his body was reduced almost raw hamburger with the stripes and the beatings. He did that for us so that we could be free. Now, when he did that, he knew full well about Genesis 6 and the Watchers. He knew full well that one day they were going to be released. He knew full well that Nimrod would come back, the son of perdition. He knew all of this, and this was his solution. Dr. Michael Heiser has a wonderful book out called Reversing Hermon. And those that deny Genesis 6 will have real problems with that book because it shows how that a majority of the ministry of Jesus was to combat what the watchers did. Huh. 
And then there are all those that are, you know, I've got de- negative RNA. I'm worried that I'm too much Nephilim. Can you feel conviction of sin? That's something a Nephilim can't do. Some of the, the, the craziest things. I can't be saved because I have negative RNA. Can you feel the convicting power of the Holy Spirit? Ding, ding, ding. You're human. Our Christians, I just don't know if I'm saved. Does the Holy Spirit get after you when you sin? Yeah. Well, the Bible says, a bastard he will not correct, but if he's correcting you, you're a son. So next time the Holy Ghost gets up in your business, you better start rejoicing. I got proof I'm a kid. He's correcting me. He's convicting me. <laughs> Ooh, you're one of the family. It says, you belong to me and I'm, and I'm here to straighten you out. Why does he do that? Because he loves us and because he wants. You see, our problem is like Peter when he was walking on the water with Jesus. We've, get, we've taken our focus off of Jesus and got our eyes on the storm. And let me tell you something, the storm had nothing to do with Peter walking on the water. If it does, if you have a pool at home, next time there's a calm day, walk across it. The storm had nothing to do with it. It was his focus. And what the world and the mystery religions are trying to do today is to get our focus off of Jesus. There's still more of him to learn. There's still greater depths to him that is waiting to be released in the body so that we're prepared for the battle that is to come. Let's go to another prophetic view of the cross, and this is found in Psalms 22. For those that try to deny the cross, that try to deny blood redemption, just start looking at the prophecies that were fulfilled just in the crucifixion of Christ in the Old Testament. It'll blow your mind. In fact, during Jesus' ministry, Mary pulled up one site where there was 356 is what they listed. But you know what's exciting to me? There are more prophetic words in the Old Testament about what he's going to do when he comes back than there was what he did the first time he came. If the first ones were fulfilled... Mm, 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 mm. Now what's interesting about this psalm, this psalm was not just written by a psalmist. If you have a decent study Bible, it says a psalm of David. David, when the anointing would come on him as king, he would write psalms. And under that anointing, he saw this. Now I read Matthew so that you would be familiar with When I read this, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Does that sound familiar? Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Far from my deliverance are the words of my groaning. Oh my God, I cried by day, but you did not answer, and by night, and I have no rest. Yet you are holy, and oh you who are enthroned upon the praises of Israel. And you, our fathers, trusted. They trusted and you delivered them to you. They cried out and were delivered. In you they trusted and were not disappointed, but I am a worm and not a man. That's what he was feeling on the cross because he was feeling the results of our sin. Even that began to fall on him when he was in prayer in the garden and that struggle of the faithful son and sinful man was so much on him that capillaries began to break in his, in his forehead and he began to bleed or sweat blood. And finally he did the only thing that he could do because he was filling our will of wanting to run from the judgment that we deserved. And he said... Your will be done, not mine. That's what's happening here. But I am a worm and not a man, a reproach of men, and despised by the people. All who see me sneer at me, and they separate 
with their lips, and they wag the head, saying, Commit yourself to the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him, because he delights in him. Yet you are he who brought me forth from the womb. You made me trust when I was upon my mother's breast. Upon you I was cast from birth. You have been my God from my mother's womb. Be not far from me, for trouble is near. For there is none to help. Many bulls are surrounding me. Strong bulls of Bashan have encompassed me. They open their mouths wide at me as a ravening and roaring lion. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax, it is melted within me. My strength is dried up like a pot shear, and my tongue cleaves to my jaw. And, I, and you lay me in the dust of the earth, for dogs have surrounded me. A band of evildoers have encompassed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. They look and stare at me. They divide my garments among them, and for my clothes they cast lots." A thousand years before the crucifixion, David writes this, and with accuracy, but I want to I show you something. When he refers to the bulls of Basham and the dogs, he's not, refu- he's not talking about human people. The rabbis, if you will, were channeling the hate that hell had for Almighty God come in the flesh. The council of hell came there to taunt him during the crucifixion. Now, what's interesting about the bulls of Basham, there was an area outside of Jerusalem. Basham was known for its breed of bulls that were bigger and stronger and fatter than all the rest. I think this refers to principalities and powers, rulers of darkness. They all convened that day And we're seeing into the spirit realm. As all of our sin is being poured on him, all of hell was there to mock him. Have you ever had the devil mock you? I think we all have. But it it doesn't stop there. You see, something happened between the cross and the throne. I've already got a video on YouTube where I prove theologically that Jesus did not die spiritually and was tormented in hell. Let me tell you something. When Jesus went down to Sheol that day, the devil found out what hell was all about. It wasn't Jesus. You see, the price was paid. It is finished. The price was paid. He came into hell the same way he came out of the grave as the glorious Lord. Paul shares this in Colossians chapter 2 verses 8 through 15. See to it that no one takes you captive with philosophies and empty deception according to the traditions of men, according to the elementary principles of the, of the world rather than according to Christ. For in him all the fullness of deity dwells in him in bodily form. Right there, it just blows my mind. Solomon said the universe wasn't big enough to hold God, but somehow another God got it in the body. Okay. And in him you have been made complete. And he is head over all rule and authority. And in him you are also circumcised with a circumcision not made with hands in removing of the bodily flesh, but the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you are also raised up with him through faith in the working of God, who raised him from the dead. You were dead in your trespasses and sin and the uncircumcision of your flesh. He made you alive together with him, having forgotten all of your transgressions and having canceled out the certificate of debt, canceling, uh, consisting of decrees against you. That was not the Torah. That was the list the devil had against you, by the way. Which was hostile toward us. And he was taking it out of the way and having nailed it to the cross. Now listen to the next verse. When did he do all this? 
when he disarmed the powers and authorities and he made a public display of them, having triumphant over them through him. When he got to hell, there was about a 30-second fight. And all the principalities and powers and Lucifer himself was dragged from one end of hell to the other as a captive that had been defeated by the Christ. The Bible says if they would have known. they thought, Can you see them going down there? And the devil sitting there told this one demon, hold my beer. Went up there and got Jesus crucified. He went back down about the time he got that beer in his hand. Jesus said, uh, we need to talk about something. You got some keys. You got some authority. You got some stuff that we're getting ready to deal with. And wiped Lucifer from one end of hell to the other. Somewhere in, in all my stuff, I've got the unpublished uh, stuff from Dr. John G. Lake, and he had paid a great sum to get a document that goes all the way back to where, you know, it talks about how the graves opened. You know, then Uncle Bill came out and started sharing, there was a commotion in, in the lower parts of Sheol. And I started hearing things cry and scream and agony and pain and fear and terror. And then Messiah came across that gulf that could not be crossed and said, I am the Messiah. I am the Lamb of God. And he preached the gospel to them. Oh, Mike, that's not in the Word. Well, let's go to 1 Peter chapter 3. Starting in verse 18. For Christ also died for sin once for all, the just for the unjust, so that he might bring us to God, having been put to death in the flesh and made alive in the Spirit, in which also he went and proclaimed to the spirits now in prison, who were once disobedient when the patience of God kept waiting in the days of Noah during the construction of the ark, in which a few that is, eight persons, were brought safely through the water. By tying it to Noah, what he preached on both sides of the cavern, what he preached in the lower parts of Sheol, resonated all the way down to Tartarus, that the watchers heard, I got it done, I got it fixed. No matter what they do in the days ahead, there is nothing that can overcome that which... He established. The psalmist said, Why do the heathens rage and the kings imagine a vain thing? He warns them, You know this Jesus you're so against, you better kiss him while you still have a chance, Jack. Because let me tell you something, when he comes back, it's like the, the old movie, I've come here to chew bubble gum and to kick butt, and I'm all out of bubble gum. That is going to be his attitude when he comes back. He is coming as Messiah ben David. There is no grace for those who rejected grace. There is only judgment. The first time he came as Yahweh, the second time he's coming as Elohim, the justice of God. And we serve him. And we can say, yeah, but Mike, you don't know my situation. And I would say, yeah, but you don't know my Jesus. Is our circumstance greater than who Jesus is and what he has accomplished? Or is it that we've consecrated, we consecrated on the storm far too much and we have not learned Jesus? The Apostle Paul said, all this, you know, he was a member of the Sanhedrin from a very affluent family. A graduate of the school of Hillel. He was so trusted that they gave him letters to say, go take care of these Christians. And God nailed them on the road to Damascus. So he was, he was like, he was a one percenter 
in ancient Judea, okay? He was a one percenter. And he looks at all that and the accolades and the degrees on his wall and the authority that he had and the trust that he had. Being a graduate of one of the wisest guys that was on the Sanhedrin, Gamaliel, who said, listen to this whole Jesus thing. If it's not a God, it'll blow over. I always wonder if Gamaliel ever remembered his words and said, you know what, this Jesus thing just keeps going and going and going, and 2,000 years later, it's still going. He said, if it's not a God, it'll pass away. If it's of God, it'll keep going. And we guys, we've got to make sure that we're not fighting against what God is doing. That was the mentor of the Apostle Paul. And Paul looked at all this and he says, I count all this as a big pile of dung or rubbish. I give it all away, all my fortune, my prestige, everything, just to know him more fully and the power of his resurrection. How deep have we gone in Christ? My suggestion to this generation is we've not gone deep enough. There's a place you get in him that's so deep that it overcomes the situations in your life. It overcomes what the crackpots are doing in political in the political arena and this, and society that is stuck on stupid. You don't think culture can get stuck on stupid? Does anybody remember the 60s? Here is definitive proof. Leisure suits. All the quirky, weird stuff that culture is just like a bull with a ring in its nose. And people are looking to identify. As you get in Christ, you step outside of all that because you find that you identify with something greater than culture. You identify something greater than the whims and the winds of doctrines and the, all the crazy stuff the world does. You're a part of a, of a kingdom that cannot be shaken and you walk to a different drummer and you're hearing a different voice and that voice says to you, you know what, I've got some good things planned for you and even though you go through some hard things, I want you to know. I'm right here with you and I'll walk through you. I'll walk with, it through, with you. David said in the 23rd Psalm, Yea, though I walk through the valley a shadow of death, I'll fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thou art with me. Who cares if that situation could be an ambush? If you led me there, you're going to bring me out on the other side. We have too shallow of an understanding of the fight and who we are in Christ and what he has wrought with us. I believe there are still levels of authority the body of Christ has not tapped. I think I kind of uh, taken aback some of the people at Skywatch TV in my last interview when I was there because I was asked, you know, Jesus came to get the authority back we're talking about. We actually have double authority, that of the first Adam and the second Adam. You know, where are we on a scale of 1 to 10? I said 2. I don't know if a pen should have dropped or a mic should have dropped. But compared to what, what's coming and what is available, guys, we are at level 2. We've got to go deeper. In this Passover, we've got to eat all the lamb. I've got to make sure that his blood is on my doorposts. That I have partaken of what he has done for me in his flesh and the spirit and all of it. I've got to, the more that I learn about Jesus and what he's accomplished, the more that faith raises up for me to partake of. That's why the saints of old kept on saying, tell me the story of Jesus. Tell me about the cross. Tell me about what he accomplished for me. Tell me about the empty grave. Tell me about how he split hell wide open. And the cries that were coming from hell was not Jesus in torment. The devil was in torment. Tell me about what happened. Let me get established in that. Let me get it down in my spirit. 
so that I want to be like David when I'm facing it, John. I'm thinking, oh no, I need a bazooka. That's what we would think. He was saying, you know what? I got a rock and I got a covenant. And who is this uncircumcised Philistine that has no covenant with the living God? While David was deep in covenant, the rest of Israel were deep in foxholes. Kind of like the body of Christ today. Get up out of that foxhole. Start learning who we are in Messiah. And you're going to find yourself on the battlefield. And the knees that are knocking are not going to be yours. They're going to be that giant the devil put in your way. Father, make it so in our lives. Let us have a hunger to know so much more about Jesus. Let us know that even two years of theology, we have just scratched the surface, and you're calling us deeper still. We ask in Jesus' name. In the Shinar Directive, we journey down the Luciferian rabbit hole to discover the matrix of darkness that has engulfed our planet. In the Shirith Imperative, we dug deeper to unearth the power source of hell itself and how the body of Christ can labor to impede its functioning in the earth and lay the groundwork for revival. Now it is time to unveil the mysteries of both the priesthood of the kingdom of God and the priesthood of darkness. Until these mysteries are understood, God's remnant cannot realize their purpose or be released with heaven's power to overcome the agenda of the denizens of the second heaven. The Kingdom Priesthood is a training manual for the remnant to discover their priesthood, their purpose, and their service to Almighty God. In the pages of this remnant manual, you will discover what Adam experienced in the first few moments of life and how those desires were written into the DNA of humanity. Revelations of what the Almighty meant when he told Adam and Eve to replenish the earth. Who were the first priests of the Kingdom of God in the Bible? And who was the first priest of darkness? What was the knowledge of the tree of good and evil offering the first family of humanity? How we all share the same calling as Abel. The reality of the principalities' wars and how it is influencing the world today. As believers, how we are to function as both a priest and a tabernacle. The real purpose of the fire of God. How to carry the name of God in the earth with dignity and power. How the priesthood is essential for the releasing of end time warriors in the last days. How to flow in the sevenfold anointing of the Holy Spirit to represent Messiah. The Kingdom Priesthood is a call for the remnant to receive the fire of God and become the assembly that the gates of hell cannot overcome. Get your copy today at Amazon.com or KingdomIntelligenceBriefing.com That's KingdomIntelligenceBriefing.com Thank you for watching Biblical Life TV. We hope and pray that today's program edified you in the Word of God. Stay informed. Tune in to weekly podcasts by Dr. Michael and Mary Lou Lake to keep you informed, inspired, and empowered in the kingdom of God. Tune in to www.kingdomintelligencebriefing.com. That's kingdomintelligencebriefing.com. This video was made possible by our partners worldwide. Please prayerfully consider supporting the ministry that is preparing the remnant for the unfolding of end times prophecy. Send your offerings to Biblical Life, P.O. Box 160, Seymour, Missouri. That's Biblical Life, P.O. Box 160, Seymour, Missouri, 65746-0160. You can also donate online at store.biblical-life.com. That's store.biblical-life.com.